What is a Buddhist nun? The Buddha himself decided, not without hesitation, to institute a female counterpart to male membership in the monastic Sangha. Nuns, called Pictionese, or female mendicants, had from the start to defer to monks, and were required to abide by over a hundred additional disciplinary regulations. Many scholars note that the formal lineage of the order of Buddhist nuns has long since been disrupted. Still, groups of women throughout Asia live in community and consider themselves members of the Sangha. Most shave their heads, wear monastic garb, and live according to traditional norms and engage in practices such as scriptural recitation. Representatives of several Chinese lineages are perhaps the most numerous. Like their male counterparts, nuns also undergo a period of training as novices. Before they can be considered for higher ordination to full monastic membership. Once presented by her sponsor, the candidate submits to an in-depth questioning as to her suitability. If she passes, a senior nun proposes acceptance. Then the candidate is questioned again by a panel of monks. Passing that, the candidate is sent back to her sisters for further training and acceptance into the higher initiation. What signs or symbols distinguish Buddhist ritual specialists? Priests who officiate in Buddhist temples that serve the public wear a variety of colors and use various implements. Priests often wear a special robe called a kashaya, kesa in Japan. The vestment is unusual in that it is typically a patchwork of many colors and textures. Recalling the simplicity and poverty of the Buddha's earliest disciples. An abbreviated form of the kesa is the wajisa, a simple swatch of cloth worn over the shoulders. Some monastic priests in Japan carry a staff called a shakuja. Six metal rings near the top make a jangling sound. Alerting small defenseless creatures to remove themselves from harm's way. The Bodhisattva Jizo, usually dressed as a monk or priest, typically carries the staff. Within private or monastic settings, ritual specialists have an even greater diversity of signs and symbols. Since their rituals are often more esoteric and complex, Tibetan monks, for example, don very colorful headgear distinctive of their various lineages for special rituals. Tibetans and members of other esoteric sects also use a wider variety of special ritual objects than are used in popular denominations. Are there any organizations or institutions that have their own distinctive structures of leadership within Shinto? An important organization in Shinto is the Shrine Guild, Miyazie. Composed of village elders who share responsibility for their local clan or parish shrine. 
each man agrees to oversee shrine affairs for a full year. Other organizations called Kosha have occasionally sought to raise funds to send members on pilgrimage or to galvanize public support for a particular project such as shrine renovation. Some of those groups eventually grew into the various Shinto sects of modern times. Various groups known as Sodeikai, Ujikokai, and Ujiko Sode, Luce. Synonyms for associations of parishioners slash worshippers have sprung up all over Japan for the purpose of gathering donations and sponsoring festivals. Unlike some other traditions, Shinto is not famous for developing. Major internal organizations such as religious or monastic orders that may connect to the fact that the Shinto priesthood itself is historically associated with heredity and clan and has never been an ordained clergy as such. There are, however, exceptions. Such as the monastic order that grew out of a sectarian lineage called Yuthitsu Shinto. Is there such a thing as a non-religious Jew? Some people who consider themselves Jews are not actively involved in the practice of the religious tradition. It is equally true that some people who call themselves Muslims or Buddhists do not engage in any religious practices. In both cases one can speak of religious identification as a cultural phenomenon. People grow up in Buddhist or Muslim families and live where the vast majority so identify themselves as if by habit. But in the case of non-religious Jews, the racial or ethnic element is at least as important as the religious, and perhaps more so. Is ritual sacrifice part of Shinto tradition? According to Shinto tradition the kami neither require nor ask for sacrificial offerings. Sacrifices in many traditions imply the need to assuage guilt or undo an evil action. Shinto tradition focuses on impurities that one can overcome merely by sincere purification. Some rituals in Shinto history have included animal sacrifice. Perhaps under the influence of imported Chinese practices. But that did not become a regular feature of Shinto worship. Are there any signs or symbols that might identify an individual as a Hindu? A small dot on the forehead, called a bindu or bindai, is perhaps the most common individual symbol in Hinduism. Many Indian women wear a small round red dot in the middle of the forehead to indicate that they are married. And some wear a black dot to ward off evil prior to marriage. Some regard the red dot as a generic symbol of one's Hindu faith, as worn by both men and women. Hindus in Europe and the United States sometimes have difficulty deciding whether to wear the dot in public or whether to confine its use to worship. 
as with so many personal religious symbols. It has become associated with issues of religious distinctiveness and cultural assimilation. Some believe the dot alludes to Shiva's third eye, a symbol of wisdom and divine power. Shaivites often wear three parallel horizontal lines on the forehead and often on upper arms and on the chest as well. The marks are sometimes made with paint and sometimes with ash to symbolize cremation. Vaishnavites wear what appears to be a large V or double V. On the forehead and sometimes on the upper arm. What are some of the ways religious groups engage society at large? Whether or not a particular faith tradition mounts major missionary efforts, it will invariably devise ways of reaching out to the larger community. Social agencies devoted to health care, disaster relief, feeding the hungry, and sheltering the homeless are an integral part of the institutional histories of most religious traditions. Though they may not be as well known and certainly do not generally have the resources as large international aid organizations, countless local Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish and other communities have given social concern high priority. For example, the Greater St. Louis Muslim community has extended its care to several thousand Bosnian refugees during the 1990s. Tutoring the children and finding jobs for their parents. Study the history of important temples, synagogues and mosques across the globe and you will encounter evidence of social outreach stretching back centuries. What is a Rashi? The Japanese term Rashi means old, i.e. venerable teacher. It is the title of the spiritual master in Zen monasteries. Monks admitted to the Zen life must submit themselves entirely to the direction of the Rashi. However harsh and unrelenting his discipline may seem. Regular activities in which Rashi and monks encounter each other include the Master's instructions to the group and monk's individual sessions in the Rashi's room. A Rashi's instructions, Taisho, Koza, take place in a lecture hall. Accompanied by two assistant monks, the Rashi burns incense before the Buddha image. After the monks recite sacred texts, the Rashi assumes his teaching chair and teaches for about an hour. Using short narratives and parables and concluding with a specific case of the issue he has been discussing. The monks are left to ponder the matter in depth. During the week long retreats, called Dai Dash Ses Shin, the great collecting thoughts, that occur monthly during the traditional rainy season seclusion, the Rashi gives instructions daily. Ordinarily, individual monks will have the opportunity for voluntary individual sessions with the Rashi at regular intervals during the course of daily order. But during the Dai Session they will each see him briefly for times daily to discuss their koan or their progress in meditation. These sessions, 
called Sanzen, are not a simple chat. There is no small talk with the Rashi. In a few choice words. The monk signals to the teacher whether he is making genuine progress. If he talks nonsense, the Rashi will toss him out unceremoniously with an admonition to get serious. One of Zen's greatest teachers, Dojin, 1200-53, described the ideal Rashi as able to transmit the Dharma. Warm but able to be harsh when necessary, standing in the Buddha's place in educating. Humble enough to ask his monks forgiveness, uninterested in fame or prestige, and concerned above all with simplicity. When it seems appropriate the monk and the Rashi might even share a hearty laugh. What do the terms diaspora and aliyah mean? Diaspora is Greek for scattering or dispersion. It refers to the growth of Jewish communities, at first throughout the Middle East, and eventually throughout the Mediterranean and the world at large. Some diaspora communities were the indirect result of the persecution and exile of Jews. Not only from the Eastern Mediterranean, but from numerous sites throughout the greater Mediterranean basin. In other words, Jews have experienced dispersion after dispersion. Aliyah means going up. In Hebrew, originally associated with travel to Jerusalem, which is a high point in the regional topography. The term came to mean especially the modern-day return of Jews to Israel. It is thus the opposite of diaspora, but much of the impetus for Aliyah continues to come from the very kind of intolerance and persecution that gave rise to many diaspora communities in the first place. In other words, global migration patterns in the history of Judaism have been cyclical. What is the meaning of the season of Lent or the Great Fast? For at least three centuries, early Christians observed a two- or three-day fast in preparation for Easter. Canons of the Council of Nicaea in 325 represent the first reference to the later. Observance of a 40-day fast recalling symbolically similar practices by Moses and Jesus. Lent now begins for Western Christians on Ash Wednesday. While Eastern Christians typically begin the Great Fast two days earlier. Until the 7th century, the season began on a Sunday, but since Sunday was exempted from fasting, the beginning was advanced so as to include a full 40 days fast. Ashes applied to the head are a reminder of human sinfulness and mortality and recall. An earlier practice in which penitents appeared in public wearing sackcloth and ashes. For centuries Christians fasted for a significant portion of each day. Monday through Saturday, and generally abstained entirely from meat. Contemporary practice has generally limited a modified form of fasting and abstinence to the first day of Lent and Good Friday. For example, Catholic practice recommends taking smaller meals at breakfast and lunch, together equaling less than one takes at the main meal, with no food in between. 
that is a far cry from serious fasting, but still at least a reminder of the purpose of the season namely. A heightened awareness of the need for spiritual conversion and dependence on God. How would you sum up Confucianism's historical relationships to other traditions? Confucianism's most important and enduring interreligious relations have been with Buddhism and Taoism. There have been periods during which Confucians have had more or less cordial dealings with representatives of the other two ways of China. But since so much has often been at stake, especially in terms of imperial patronage, Confucian scholars have frequently leveled serious criticisms at Taoist and Buddhist views. For example, Confucians have sometimes faulted Buddhism for being too otherworldly. Too disconnected from the ordinary problems and needs of regular people. Confucians generally interpreted the Buddhist ideal of celibate monastic life as an abdication of filial devotion and the responsibility to perpetuate the family lineage. Deists, on the other hand, have characteristically struck Confucians as naive in their conviction that if left to themselves, people will naturally follow an exemplary leader. Taoism's emphasis on doing things nature's way leaves society too vulnerable to simple lawlessness. In addition, the Confucian tradition's strong emphasis on education seemed to many to be irreconcilable with Taoism's more organic and seemingly anti-intellectual approach to learning. When Confucian tradition began to come into prominence during Japan's Tokugawa era, it found an increasingly hostile official response from representatives of Shinto. Confucianism, Shinto authorities argued, was a non-Japanese influence and therefore undesirable. By that time, however, Confucius had already made an indelible impression on Japanese society. Is there any difference between meditation and contemplation? Meditation and contemplation are important practices in many religious traditions. The two terms are often used synonymously to refer to a prayerful focus on inner spiritual realities. There are, however, some important differences in the methods used for that focusing. It is helpful to keep in mind that there are variations in both theory and practice among the major religious traditions. In general, meditation involves a non-discursive concentration on some object, either verbal or visual. The idea is not to engage in thinking about the object of focus, but merely to allow it to function as a kind of controlled distraction. By targeting the focal object exclusively, the meditator frees up the mind and spirit to achieve a deeper level of simple awareness. Many traditions follow the practice of having a preceptor or spiritual guide assign a specific symbol to each meditator. That symbol can be a word or a phrase, sometimes called a mantra repeated slowly and deliberately. It can also be an object upon which the meditator concentrates visually. Such as a candle flame or a flower. 
when a meditator becomes aware that the mind is wandering. The solution is to observe my mind is wandering or something similar, and return to concentration. Gradually the number and intensity of distractions dwindle. Some traditions allow that there is important intellectual content in meditation. Such as a point of doctrine on which the meditator reflects for deeper insight. Contemplation involves a different method. Here the immediate goal is to enter imaginatively into a spiritual reality. And ultimately to be united with that reality. As its Latin root words suggest. The contemplator seeks to become one with or abide in a sacred place, come, with, and templum, temple. Some traditions hold that contemplation is a state of pure intuition beyond any mental content. Others include in their understanding of contemplation the active imaginative entry into an important scene. As if the contemplator were there with the players in some sacred action. Whatever the precise definition or method used in a particular tradition. It is fair to suggest that meditation precedes and prepares for contemplation. Who are Shi'i Muslims? Various Shi'i communities have been identifiable since at least the 8th century. Among the principal features that distinguish Shi'i from Sunni tradition is the belief that a legitimate successor to leadership, called Imam, pronounced E-E-M-A-A-M, -A must be designated by his predecessor and belong to the family of the Prophet. According to ancient Shi'i belief, Muhammad did designate his cousin Ali, but Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman managed to usurp power and prevent Ali from assuming his rightful place. Around the middle of the 8th century a split developed over who would be the 7th Imam. One group continued to pledge their loyalty to a man named Ismail, who had just died. Even though Ismail's father, the 7th Imam Jafar, appointed a replacement when Ismail died. The faction that stayed with Ismail came to be called the Ismailis. Or Seveners, since their line of Imams ended then. There are now at least two major branches of Seveners. One of which looks to the Aga Khan as its spiritual leader. The larger group of Shiites in the 8th century believed the legitimate line of Imams extended to a 12th. And ended when that Imam went into concealment until his expected return at the end of time. Twelver Shiites are by far the majority community. Constituting nearly all of Iran's and more than half of Iraq's people. Have Confucians or CIT ordinarily engaged in ritual sacrifice? Sacrifice of certain animals has long been part of Confucian observances. Both of the Master's birthday and of certain types of ancestor memorial. Two kinds of ritual sacrifice have also been historically associated with CIT. The Feng, High Altar Mound, and Shan, Level Ground. 
sacrifices were those offered to heaven and earth, respectively. Some emperors used the public performance of these rituals as a way of declaring and expressing gratitude for their possession of the mandate of heaven. History records that a number of emperors, even down to the last dynasty, engaged in the sacrifices atop or at the foot of sacred mountains. Animals sacrificed ritually most commonly included sheep and pigs. But occasionally wild game animals like deer were also sacrificed. Larger and more expensive ceremonies might feature oxen splayed across a rack after slaughtering. Or the burnt offering of a whole young red bull red is the color of yang. The energy needed to return warmth to the earth so that spring will renew all living things. In the Temple of Heaven complex, for example. A large slaughterhouse and spirit kitchen accommodated extensive sacrificial needs. 80 butchers and 280 cooks processed vast quantities of material. A year's worth of sacrifices, according to one record, included nearly a thousand pigs. Over 800 sheep, over 200 each of deer, cows and rabbits and over a hundred goats. What is a priest? A socio-religious class called priesthood has ancient roots in various traditions. Some priestly classes have perpetuated themselves through heredity. Some have been intimately associated with the performance of sacrificial ritual, whether bloody or not. And are typically connected with temple or church institutions both large and small. In some traditions, priests have been celibate as a group. But in most marriage is a prerequisite for all priests. Most of all, the priest functions as the chief ritual specialist and is often considered a mediator of spiritual power. An indispensable connection between the divine and the human. Even in societies where a hereditary priesthood is the norm. Some type of specialized training is generally expected and provided. More often than not priestly education aims to steep the trainee in the sacred text and its ritual uses. As well as in the ritual actions the priest can be expected to perform hundreds or even thousands of times a year. On the whole it is safe to say that priests in most traditions are trained less as professional theologians than as public servants commissioned to facilitate the devotional life of the community. Special rituals called ordination in some traditions designed to dedicate individuals to the priesthood often bring the time of training to its culmination. Priesthoods are typically restricted to male membership, though there are some exceptions. What does the symbol called the swastika have to do with Hinduism? The name swastika comes from a Sanskrit term that means all is well. It is a symbol of auspiciousness and good fortune. The symbol may derive from a four-spoked wheel. Possibly connected with the crossed firebrands of ancient Vedic sacrifice. 
Originally a solar symbol, the swastika was anciently associated with Vishnu. But eventually became important in Buddhism as well. Even though Shiva has been particularly connected with lunar symbolism. The swastika has become common in the iconographic repertoire of Shaivites too. Swastikas can appear to be spinning either to the right or to the left. And have accordingly been associated with either the so-called right or left-handed sects of Shaktism and Tantrism. The female symbolism of the left-handed swastika was generally considered inauspicious. Nazi Germany adopted the right-handed swastika because they associated it with Aryan ethnicity and thus with their pretensions to ancient racial purity. Hindus and Buddhists continue to use the symbol in many contexts. Do Muslims believe in miracles? Muhammad's early critics in Mecca sometimes taunted him for being so much like an ordinary human being. If he were really a prophet of God, surely he would entertain them with some sort of heavenly pyrotechnics. Muhammad regarded the Quran itself as his only miracle. A marvel of eloquence uttered by a man considered technically unlettered. But the scripture does refer often to spectacular signs God brought about to vindicate earlier prophets. For example, Moses' staff became a dragon that devoured Pharaoh's magicians. And Moses' hand turned white with leprosy and was then restored to health. Quran 7 107-08 Within a generation or two of Muhammad's death, tradition had begun to attribute to the Prophet a number of extraordinary occurrences. He could fast for inordinately long periods, could see people behind him, heal various ailments. Supply water where there was none, and stretch limited food sources as needed. Trees and stones saluted Muhammad, a pillar in his house mourned that the Prophet no longer leaned on it when he preached. And the Prophet split the moon in two to confound his critics. Throughout the history of Islam holy persons called friends of God have been famous for the ability to perform wondrous deeds. Many Muslims today regard accounts of such legend and lore of secondary importance. Classical Muslim theologians devise technical terms to distinguish between two levels of miracle. They called the works God did as proof of his prophet's truthfulness evidentiary miracles, mujizat. Pronounced Mujizat, and those affected by friends of God marvels, Karamat, pronounced Karamat. Theologians further called attention to key differences between works of sorcery and wonders performed authentically under divine power. What is the Ark of the Covenant? Part of the revelation Moses received at Sinai included specific instructions from God about how to prepare a holy place in which the people could come to be in the presence of God. First they were to fashion a special tent, called the tabernacle. Then the ark in which the tablets of the law would be kept. The ark was to be a gold-clad box of acacia wood of specific dimensions. 
it was to have two rings on either side to accommodate poles for carrying it. Since the Ark had to be portable the people were still on the move. On top there was to be a mercy seat made of gold in the shape of two cherubs facing each other. Whose wings would spread over the mercy seat. Ironically, this feature of the most sacred of all ritual objects must have been. One of the rare examples of three-dimensional figural art in the history of Judaism. The mercy seat was to be a symbol of the place to which God would descend to meet Moses. Inside the tabernacle a large veil was to separate the larger part of the space from a space called the Holy of Holies, in which the Ark would be kept. From then on, the Ark would travel with Israel, resting only temporarily in any given location. Until Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. In the temple the Ark was to reside permanently in the innermost part, also called the Holy of Holies. What are some of the main varieties of Jewish religious officials or specialists? During biblical times the centralized cult of the temple in Jerusalem required a large and elaborate system of specialists and functionaries. Special roles were assigned to tribes, and to certain clans and families within the tribes. Destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE brought dramatic change in its wake. Including a great simplification in ritual practice. The shift to local synagogue worship naturally required the development of a local officialdom whose duties would include presiding over much smaller scale ritual and, at the same time, looking after the more comprehensive spiritual needs of a local community for whom the synagogue was now the focus of religious life. The rabbi, Hebrew for my master, is the principal religious authority and community. Representative in contemporary Judaism as well as the primary leader of synagogue worship. The latter function seems to be a relatively modern development. With emphasis in earlier post-biblical eras on the rabbi as scholar and teacher. In some regions, rabbinical conferences or other organizations may elect or appoint one of their members to serve as chief rabbi. Most synagogues and local communities divide duties among several other offices. One of the more important is that of the cantor, Hazan. Often a person of considerable musical ability and training whose duty is to chant sacred text and to sing special prayers for the various religious observances. The position has been especially necessary in communities whose members generally do not read Hebrew. In late antiquity the term Hazan referred to several community functions. But later it was applied exclusively to the cantor, Shalayaksabur. Throughout Jewish history, Many rabbis have served as cantors in their synagogues. But rabbi cantors are now less common. In some congregations a layperson called the gabbe, overseer, roughly, has the duty of commissioning Torah readers for each service. Where do religion and political power come together?
virtually every religious tradition has had to come to terms with its relationship to civil authority and power. As often as not, the relationship varies at least slightly from one political setting to another. Even in the United States, many traditions have shifted their positions historically. The standard and seemingly straightforward principle of separation of church and state has been reinterpreted in various ways. With prominent religious figures seeking and winning national elected office as high as the United States Senate. The situation has historically been still more complex where Political rulers have declared one religious tradition the state creed. That has often meant hard times for members of faith communities. That have not enjoyed official patronage and protection. Popular perception nowadays tends to label Islam as the tradition. Most likely to take political shape, as if no other has ever done so. But ample data from the history of religion suggests that questions of the relationship of temporal to spiritual power have arisen for virtually every major tradition at some time or other. How important was the school of national learning? National learning, or kokugaku, had perhaps more to do with the modern understanding of Shinto than has any other movement within the tradition. Katan no Azumamaro, 1669-1736, is generally considered the founder of the school. Insisting on the need to return to the earliest genuinely and purely Japanese sources. Among those he included the Kyojiki, but emphasized the Kojiki and Nihongi especially. Kamo no Mabuchi, 1697-1769 Continued what Kata had begun by applying philological methods to classical Japanese prayer and poetry. He considered spontaneity the native Japanese gift, without which nothing could be truly Japanese. Motori Norinaga, 1730-1801, continued the scholarly dynasty, and is still regarded by some as Shinto's best theological mind. His 44-volume commentary on the Kojiki remains a monument of scholarship. Hirata at Sutain, 1763-1843, was the latest and perhaps most influential exponent of the school. In that he implemented the thought of his predecessor Motori. Together these four men were largely responsible for the articulation of modern Shinto's highly nationalistic and ethnocentric tone. What kind of calendar do Shinto practitioners observe? Shinto reckoning of ritual time has been much influenced by Chinese traditions. As early as 675 CE, religious Taoism had made a significant impact on the Japanese imperial court which formally adopted many deist practices. Most importantly, the court set up a special bureau of divination, called the Onmyrio, Office of Yin-Yang, based on deist principles. 
One of the Onmyrio's chief functions was to establish a liturgical calendar that patterned earthly life on the rhythms of the cosmos. This lunar calendar retains all the main features of its Chinese model, including the cycles of 60 years based on the combinations of 12 branches and 10 stems. See the sections on Daoism and Confucianism. The Japanese call their Chinese version of the lunar calendar Kyurki, as distinct from the modern solar calendar adopted in 1872, the Shinriki, an early formal cycle of annual observance. Called the Nanchugyuji, literally year round discipline rituals developed as early as the 10th century CE. Imperial authorities promulgated it in a vast historical record called the Enji Shiki, Institutes of the Enji Era. 901-23 CE, an essential source of information about Shinto ritual in general. Japan's lunar calendar needs to tuck in an extra month every three years or so. Prior to the 19th century, many Shinto shrines maintained their own calendars of events, including uniquely regional and local festivities. Today some major events still take place according to various ways of adapting the lunar calendar to fit the solar. For example, some festivals now occur on the same numbered day within the same numbered month, but transferred to the solar reckoning. In other words, a festival that fell on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month now falls on July 7th. Some festivals are now dated by keeping the day date but adding a solar month. So that a celebration once held on the seventh day of the seventh month now occurs on August 7th. Finally, and more rarely. A few special days retain their lunar dating completely, so that they rotate backwards against the solar year. From the solar point of view, therefore, these are movable feasts. Since the late 19th century, the timing of the major festivals has been coordinated so that all the larger shrines observe them at the same time. But there are still many distinctive local and regional festivities attached to individual shrines. Such as the rituals dedicated to the patron deities of particular places. In addition to the liturgical calendar, an important related feature is the Japanese custom of dividing history according to imperial reigns or epochs. Emperor Hirohito died in 1989, ending the Showa era. And his son Akihito's accession inaugurated the Hisei epoch. Why is the Chinese New Year so important? Chinese New Year festivities are associated, not surprisingly, with renewal generally and with powers that hold the promise of protection for the coming year. During these celebrations, Religious Chinese add to their regular roster of symbolism extra images of important figures like the Eight Immortals and the deities of happiness, success, and longevity. New Year is not a specifically deist observance, but rather a more generic special occasion on which people are moved to intensify their awareness of essential values. Festivities begin about 10 days before the actual day. It starts when families send Cao Jun, 
Deity of the Stove To give an account of the family's deeds over the previous year to the Jade Emperor. On New Year's Day, Cao Jun returns to his kitchen throne. Where the family welcomes him with a fresh picture for the wall. Most families observe a series of private rituals. Including elaborate meals and reverence to the ancestors. During the following two weeks or so, people pay special homage to the god of wealth. Festivities end with the Lantern Festival at the New Year's first full moon. Do Hindus believe in devils? No single personification of evil functions in Hindu tradition quite like the Satan of other traditions. Multiple embodiments of malice, perversity, and general negativity are called asuras, or demons. Ancient myths tell of the ongoing struggle between the devas, deities, and the demons for control of the cosmos. Originally the demons were not necessarily considered altogether evil. Even their generic names are ambiguous, Deva is from the same root as Devil. While Azura shows up in the name of the main Iranian deity, Ahura Mazda. Both deities and demons descended from Prajapti, Lord of Living Things. Demons were at first ethically on a par with the gods. But the gods generally managed to win more battles than their siblings. Eventually the deities came to be known as more clever and more truthful. Finally, the gods achieved immortality while preventing the demons from winning that prize. Demons retain the ability to assume virtually any form in their attempts to disrupt cosmic affairs. Powerful people intent on evil could enlist the aid of demons to carry out their wicked deeds. Some demons came to represent impersonal negative qualities, such as ignorance. Lesser but still troublesome forces known as Buddhas remain important in the lives of many villagers. Buddhas are the spirits of those who died violently, or too young. Or after betrothal but before marriage, for example. Resentful and frustrated, they wander about harassing the living unless appeased by proper rituals. Hindus believe that ultimately the divine power will overcome all demonic forces. How do Hindus ritualize marriage? Traditional Hindu families continue the ancient practice of arranged marriage and generally do not countenance the kind of dating practices prevalent among non-Hindus in the United States. Marriage within one's caste remains a major concern for most Hindus, whether within India or abroad. An extended period of betrothal usually follows the initial arrangements between the families. And includes the exchange of gifts and chaperoned meetings of the betrothed. Ceremonies typically occur in the early evening, after sunset, in a venue chosen by the families. In the temple, the home, or at a local hotel. One or more priests preside over the ceremony, reciting set ritual texts from the scriptures. 
In India one priest often appears as a representative for each family. Astrological consultation still often determines the specific auspicious timing of the ceremony. Wedding ceremonies begin with the family of the bride symbolically giving away their daughter. After the community greets the new couple. The officiant chants special prayers while the bride and groom sit before a fire holding hands. Concluding the formal ritual, the bride and groom express consent by taking the seven steps symbolizing energy. Vitality, success, happiness, wealth. Traditionally measured in livestock, auspicious turning of the seasons, and friendship. Extended receptions generally follow the ceremonies. What is the Confucian and Literati view of ancestor veneration? Confucius did not invent ancestor veneration, but his teaching placed great emphasis on the practice. Already a millennium old by Confucius time, ancestor veneration had much to do with the rather utilitarian belief that malcontent spirits of the deceased could cause great trouble. Better to attend to their needs before they became disgruntled. But Confucius stressed a more positive note of reverence for those who have gone before. And of maintaining connections with one's sacred past. So much of what we are is our history. In Korea, descendants of the Yi dynasty still gather annually to perform memorial rites with full traditional costume and music. This Yi dynasty association maintains dynastic memorial tablets in an ancestral shrine in Seoul called Kongmyo. To each of the 18 major Yi rulers enshrined there, the worshippers offer three cups of wine and choice food. Scholars often credit Confucian influence in Japan with the continued prevalence of ancestor veneration there. What is apostasy? The term apostasy comes from the Greek compound apostasis literally standing away or apart from. Hence rebellion or secession. It differs from heresy in several important respects. Heresy involves refusal to accept one or more mainstream doctrinal positions. But those holding the heretical views do not necessarily mean to repudiate the religious tradition altogether. In other words, heresy means a kind of selective rejection of religious teachings. Often in the sincere belief that a certain view is simply mistaken. Apostasy implies a blanket rejection of a faith tradition and a return to former views or to another tradition. So, for example, some early Christians reverted to paganism, and some 7th century Bedouin Arabs who had become Muslims rejected Islam when Muhammad died, and fell back on their ancient tribal ways. Official punishments for both apostasy and heretical beliefs have often been severe, including death and have depended a great deal on the degree to which religious authorities exercised political clout. In the time of Constantine 
apostate Christians suffered very harsh forms of banishment and loss of legal rights. Are there Confucian rituals or beliefs around marriage and family life? Confucian tradition Chinese tradition in general, really teaches that marriage is meant to perpetuate the extended family rather than to create new small social units, all going their separate ways. Marriages arranged by matchmakers have long been the rule. Complete with elaborate astrological calculations to assure cosmic compatibility. The equivalent of a dowry from the groom's parents. Means the bride has been bought from her family of origin. When young Chinese marry in the traditional way. The new couple virtually fuse with the husband's family of origin. As long as an older male survives in the groom's family, the groom and his wife own no property. Most striking of all, perhaps, is that the bride no longer makes ritual offerings to her own family, but only to her husband's ancestors. Young married couples have historically felt enormous pressure to produce a male heir for the family. Traditional Chinese marriage rituals have not generally been considered sacramental as in some other traditions. Nor is marriage a purely civil matter, for the family is the custodian of the sacred in Chinese tradition. What kind of religious calendar do Jews observe? The Jewish liturgical calendar combines elements of both lunar and solar reckoning. Lunar months are 29 or 30 days long, and the first month of the year is that in which the Exodus began. But tradition dictates that certain feasts must occur during certain seasons. So the calendar has to be adjusted every so often to prevent the lunar months from straying too far from the agricultural, or solar, cycle. To make it work, an extra month, called Adarshini, second Adar is added during 7 out of every 19 years. The Jewish lunar months are called Tishri, September-October, Cheshvan, October-November. Kislev, November-December, Teves, December-January, Shavat, January-February, Adar, February-March. Adarshini, second Adar, inserted only in leap years, Nisan, March slash April, Iyar. April slash May, Sivan, May slash June, Tammuz, June slash July, AV, July slash August, and Elul, August slash September. With the leap year provision. The lunar months slide back or forward but remain within the solar months indicated in parentheses. Are there distinctive forms of Hindu initiation? Boys of the twice-born castes are initiated into the tradition in special ceremonies called Upanayana, which mark the beginning of formal instruction in sacred learning. 
the initiate receives a thread and wears it draped across the shoulder as a symbol of this second birth. Women no longer receive the thread and only Brahmins. Nowadays wear it when not engaged in ritual ceremonies. Sacred threads are of white wool for Brahmins, of red hemp for Kshatriyas, and of yellow wool for Vaishyas. Tradition dictated that Brahmins be initiated at seven or eight years of age. Kshatriyas at eleven, and Vaishyas at twelve. But regardless of caste, most of those who still engage in the formal ceremony generally associate it with puberty. Is the term revelation useful in understanding Shinto tradition?